All right, let's talk about die casting. So die casting is a lot like injection molding, which will be fresh in your memory. Um, in fact, uh, die casting even came historically before injection molding. Um, it was one of their earlier processes. What we'll talk about is just an overview of die casting. Uh, we'll talk about how the process works. Uh, we'll spend the most time on part design. And again, there's a lot of similarities with injection molding. And then talk a bit about materials. So um, again, similar to injection molding, um, got a few example parts here that we can pass around. These three are sequential, making this um, connector for this kind of scary <laughs> high voltage, uh, high current um, connector. But you can see the different phases of the process from you know just out of the tool to some sort of coating applied to it and then um, uh, they're fairly similar and then crimped onto the onto the cable um, uh, pass these around. But basically uh, if you can't get enough strength out of an injection molded part then die casting is a great thing to uh, consider. Uh, so essentially you're moving from plastic to metal? It, moving from plastic to metal, exactly. Okay. Yep, and then you know it's not only uh, mechanically stronger, it's going to be a lot more, uh, offer a lot broader range of thermal um, oh. conditions it can survive in. Um, it's also a lot more UV um, tolerant than, than plastic might be. But you can imagine again like connectors, housing, gears, those are all great things to, uh, to die cast. So here's uh, some of the uh, advantages to consider. Um, again, it's uh, complexity is free, at least at the part level. You have to pay more for the tool, but you can just do some amazing things that you wouldn't want to consider CNCing. Um, it can do extremely thin walls, uh, and again, it's probably thinner than you'd want to uh, want a machine. Uh, it's very stable from a, a mechanical and geometry standpoint. Again, being being metal at all, and it's got um, a good surface finish, not necessarily represented on these pieces, but it's um, it's usually not quite as good as what you can get from injection molding, but it's certainly within, um, within the ballpark. And it's one of these techniques that we'd often use for high volume. If you're going to do low volume, it's probably not the right, the right fit for what you're trying to do. What is the material? Uh, so there's basically four alloys you can pick from. These are a mix of uh, zinc and aluminum. Okay. Um, and we'll talk in more detail about sort of the different alloys and the trade-offs you'd, you'd make in terms of picking them. Uh, in terms of the, the downsides or reasons not to do die casting is one, again, you've got to build this big tool that costs money and takes six to eight weeks. So if you want to five parts and you want them quickly, there's probably better ways to, uh, to do that. It is difficult being a big, heavy, expensive tool, um, difficult to make changes. So you'd want to have a nice, solid design before you went to the tooling stage. And we were talking a little bit before about, um, in particular, with the techniques we use for high volume manufacturing. You know, when you're in the CAD stage, it's very easy to make changes. It's you know almost trivial. But once you've actually cut the tool, it's very expensive and time consuming. So you want to really plan this stuff out carefully. Um, and again, you want to uh, measure um, twice cut once. Um, large undercuts are difficult and with this again it, there's going to be shrinkage so as the part cools it's going to get smaller. You can't do slides on uh, an inside core so um, it's just the metal is way too strong and it's going to sneak in with the flash between the moving parts uh, and there's just not a strength, enough strength or real estate in the tool to do that. So unlike injection molding, um, you couldn't do any uh, internal uh, slides on a core. And you do have limited alloys. Uh, there's really, there could be six if you consider um, tin and lead, but we don't really use those um, anymore. Do tin? Does yeah. just plate everything? Back in the day, um, <laughs> these days we don't. Um, and they're also so weak that it's, there would be like, you probably just use plastic. Um, so fortunately, we've got a lot better, better alloys that we can play with now. Um, so that's sort of the pros and cons. In terms of how the process works, uh, this is a standard die casting uh, 
shop, they'll paint the billets different colors so you can keep track of what alloy it is because if you just look at it, it's very difficult to, to keep track of them. And this is um, what we call a, um, a cold chamber. So here's the die casting machine. You'll see in the back it's the ladle, which is going to pick up the molten, um, in this case it's an alloy of zinc and aluminum, and literally pour it into a, um, a chamber, which is where a cylinder is, and that's going to pressurize it to about 500 psi and inject, uh, inject it into the um, injected into the tool. Um, and again, your tool maker will worry about this. The difference between hot and cold is with uh, metal is, of course, very, it, to melt it requires a significant temperature. Uh, for some, you can't put the pump inside the molten metal, inside the molten metal because it's just going to deteriorate. So in that case, you'd want to use this crucible um, and scoop it up and, and dump it in. Um, again, it's the, the tool maker will, will take care of that. Um, but it's a very similar process where the melt is injection into the tool, um, it clamps, it cools, and then it's ejected again. Let's see, and here you can see some of the processes. So this is the shot coming out. Um, these are the runners and the biscuit, which is effectively the sprue. And then some of the post-processing we can do. So this is a pretty cool drilling machine, which has five different drill bits on um, universal joints. And basically, after it comes out, it will drill these holes um, for whatever alignment features are needed. This is a die trimmer, where you put the, um, the shot in here, and then it's just a stamping machine to trim off the flash. All um, die cast parts are going to have significant flash. So you need a way to trim it. And it's like a razor blade that if you don't, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, here's just a bunch of uh, crankshafts, um, or I'm sorry, um, uh, pistons um, that were shot. And then here's some CNCing that you can do to it. So usually when you do die casting, you can count on some sort of post-processing, which adds, again, time and money, whereas often injection molding is um, just ready to go right off the bat. Post-machining die. It's, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and so there's definitely a, a plus and a minus to die casting. I mean, if you can, in general, can get by with injection molding, that's often a much better way to go. It's cheaper, it's faster, um, and there's less hateful post-machining. This is just a measuring process here, looking at the uh, inside diameter of this piston, um, which is going to meet with the crankshaft. So you can get really nice, um, precise fits. So jumping into the main part of it, the, um, as you're designing die casting parts, what are the things you should consider? Uh, and the main thing is, if you can use injection molding, that's great, you should do that. But if you can't, then um, die casting is a good fallback plan. Uh, you can do, in general, pretty thin um, walls. So depending on your alloy, you can even go down to one millimeter, um, which is doable with injection molding, but on, on the thin side. And you would want to pick your alloy um, to do that. And you can also do up to 10 millimeters, whereas remember from injection molding, kind of the most you'd want to do is 4 millimeters. A uh, key thing to keep in mind here is that strength is not proportional to wall thickness, because as you inject a thicker wall in um, die casting, there's going to be a lot of porosity in the center uh, just due to the cooling, so you're going to have a, a thicker skin and um, a thinner center. So don't think it's going to be um, that the strength is going to scale in a linear sense. But in some parts for geometry, you may want to go for that, that thicker part. Again, same trick, 80% uh, on your ribs. Um, with this, the shrinkage typically is less than injection molding, so you don't need to worry as much about the techniques to avoid sink marks um, on the back. And that's because the cooling is a function, a linear function of thickness. Whereas an injection molding, because of the thermal um, characteristics of plastic, it, the cooling is a function of the thickness squared. So the, the metal will cool much quicker and less um, shrink marks. And um, the draft is really a function of, of the alloy. Uh, in general, you'd probably want to plan on about one degree of a, a draft for most ones. And typically, on an inner um, core, you'd want to have a little bit more because, again, as it shrinks down, it's going to hug that core. Whereas on the outside surface, it's um, on the cavity side, it's shrinking away from that. Um, 
and then the tolerances are relatively similar to what you'd see for uh, injection molding. And again, it does depend on, on the alloy. Hmm. Um, and this is just talking about secondary ops are hateful, so. <laughs> but they are, they are gonna be in there. Uh, so, but otherwise, I'd use exactly the same rules as you use designing a, a part for injection molding. In terms of... Material cost, maybe. Oh yeah, that, you are a great straight man. So yes, material cost um, and different alloys. So what we've got a, here is just a chart of the basic ones. Um, zinc, uh, zinc aluminum alloy, aluminum, magnesium, copper. And then just for comparison, I threw uh, glass-filled nylon down in the bottom there. And you can just look at the different Young's modulus and yields. Um, you'll see that the dye life is significantly different depending on the alloy. So for copper, it's terrible. It's 15,000 versus half a million. And the reason for that is for copper, you typically have to run at a much higher melting, or the melting temperature is higher. So there's greater thermal cycling, which just wears out the mold much more quickly. Um, so you'd want to um, understand why you'd want to... So that would be true for a bronze alloy as well? Yes. Yep. Yeah, anything from with a copper base in it, um, you're going to face that same, that same problem. What would be an application that you'd need that for? Yeah, often for strength um, or for corrosion, um, copper might, might make sense. So like an electrical environment? Yeah, and certainly um, just the conductivity of copper is great if, if you are carrying, um, carrying current. Yeah, I mean, the ones that we typically see are, if you can, zinc or um, uh, zinc, aluminum, or aluminum are kind of the main ones that we would get into. And that's what the parts I, uh, I passed around are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly for electrical conductivity, some copper alloy um, would, would be worth considering. Scott, what about the cost <clears throat> relative? You have mm. glass field nylon. What about just ABS, say, for example? Yes. Is it significantly more money for a die cast part? Yes, yeah, I thought the cost. Oh, here we go. Um, so ABS, ABS would roughly be a dollar. Um, so this okay. is, uh, you know, a roughly twice, twice tw 2x. Yeah. Per kilogram. Per kilogram, yeah. How do you think that works out? Like, if, you pr if you made the same part? Right. Well, so you have a few things to consider um, when we think about costing. One is the weight of the shot, um, which will vary because with this, you're carrying a lot of extra plumbing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the biscuit and the, the runner to get in there. Um, and then two is the cycle time, um, how many can you get through, which you'd want to apply the overhead of running the machine. Um, okay. You know, if it has a slow cycle time, um, and you amortize that into the cost of an hour, it would typically be more, um, more money. The, um, as a rough rule of thumb, you know, maybe a die cast part using zinc or aluminum is about two times that of, a, of an injection molded part. Okay. So it's not terrible. But where, it, for the molding part, where it gets you is the hateful secondary operations. Um, and then those add, you know, whatever they do. And often you typically will have to plate a die cast part to prevent corrosion. Um, so that you've got to clean it. And then we used to use what I remember as CNC, so copper, nickel, uh, chrome, if you want to make it nice and shiny. And that's you know those three steps, and sometimes you need two coats of copper. Um, so by the time you're done with it, you know it might be four or five times um, the cost of what you might pay for a, a molded part. And then every time you do an operation, there's a chance to screw it up along the way. So your scrap rate's going to go up, and and all of this, um, which is why, if possible, injection molding is is a better you know off the bat um, thing. But sometimes you just can't get away with it. And also, you know, when we were doing the scuba, we wanted to have a really nice handle for a great customer experience and their perception of value. Um, and for that, the molded plastic would have been fine, and eventually we went to that. But initially, just like a big, beefy metal handle felt, felt great. I think we paid something like $4 for that handle, which wow. was um, die cast with all this, the copper nickel chrome. And I think when we molded it, it was 28 cents. <laughs> but the perception, like, you know, the scuba felt like a really quality machine because that was something you were interacting with all the time. So you have, to, you have to weigh that. But you start adding up all these other operations and it gets to be expensive. Do you lose, do you change physical material properties like ductility or, or mm. fracture resistance? Yes, yep, they do vary among the, um, among the alloys. And I believe copper or copper alloys have the best um, mechanical strength. But like it, it well, I 
I mean, I know what aluminum is like when, when I buy it in, in wire and sheets and stuff. Right. If I die cast aluminum, uh, is it going to be more fragile? Interesting. It would have a different structure. So if you compare it, think of like extruded 6061 T6, mm -hmm. um, the way those grains go versus with this, it's transitioning. Yeah, I, can be, I can be confident that I can bend that and, and it'll look bad, but it won't break. Right. These would typically be more brittle. Um, and it depends on also on the grain size. So if you had a really thick, like suppose you go big and you go for that 10 millimeter wall, you know that's probably going to be a lot more um, a lot more brittle because you're going to have a bigger grain. Um, whereas if you keep to a two millimeter wall, it's going to be a tighter a tighter grain and a little bit more forgiving. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking things like heat sink fins, mm. which are you know two three millimeters. Yeah, they would typically be more more brittle than if they were. Um, if they are extruded. Yeah, and often you, most, there are many heat sink fins we see typically are extruded and then you just, you know, chop mm -hmm. them off like a loaf of bread. Um, but with when that, of course, it's... When it has to fit in a weird little space. Right. And you want as much radiated surface as possible. Yeah, if you have weird geometry, like do the limitations of extrusion, it's always a 2D, yeah. 2D type profile unless you have that hateful uh, <laughs> post-ops. <laughs> that, that's a term of art. Yeah, yes. Hateful, hateful post-processing operations. <laughs> exactly. Um, this is just a quick uh, table uh, from Boothroyd Dewhurst, which does a great job of just comparing the different surface finishes, um, which often, as we mentioned, you need to do, just to uh, see how the, the costs all stack up. When you do uh, cost estimating, do you have particular tools that you use, or do you have based on yeah. experience? Do you we, so we'll um, typically work off uh, first order estimation, which is the cost of the resin, uh, or cost of the shot based on the material, and then the overhead of the machine, add them together and then multiply by one plus the factory markup, um, which gives you a good starting point, and then you have to do the hateful post-ops to figure out how long those take, and for that you could figure out how long does it take to do it and what's it, what does it cost to um, operate that machine. There's definitely, um, and there's definitely math beyond that for if you wanted to calculate specifically the cost of the tool and how long does it take to machine that, and so on. So you can break it down into the second and third orders. Um, we'll usually start with the first one because that gets us you know, 95% of the way there. And then the factory will come back with um, you know, whatever they think it should cost and we can negotiate to, to, to get a fair price. Doesn't uh, Boothroyd and Dewhurst have a piece of software they do. Yeah, they've got very close. extensive software to, to you know go to the fifth order of um, exactly what it sh what it should cost, or at least. Have you folks uh, ever used it? We typically don't. Um, I've used it a little bit before, and I think it's a really interesting model. For what we have, um, you know, we typically work in the initially the five to fifty thousand um, unit volume, where the cost isn't. A, it's important, but um, <coughs> the design is probably going to evolve and change. As we get up into the million plus units, like at a million dollars, every penny is ten thousand dollars. So then we start to, you know, focus more and more on that, going as far as you know, counting every screw, weighing every part, looking at every press to make sure that it's accurate to what's represented in the build materials um, for their charging. And I think, you know, if we were, we typically don't operate more than three or four million units a year. Uh, if we got beyond that, then you know, really peeling it back. Like if we were building, we had once gone to a DVD drive factory where they had 300,000 workers and the whole factory was tooled up to make these things. Like there, you know, they're down to every, yeah, they're, they're down to the atomic level, you know, understanding how many atoms are in the thing. Um, but yeah, where we play, it's kind of, um, the first order is, is a good starting point. And you can also achieve a lot by negotiation. Um, so sort of, sort of balancing that. Have you talked to uh, a priori over in Concord? Ah. They have some great cost estimating tools. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I've heard the name, but I haven't. Based. It's directly off the CAD model. Do some. Okay. And they have some cost models for injection molding, for die casting, sand casting, progressive die. Okay. So they'll work right off the CAD model and calculate the cost for you. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, a priori in, in Concord Mass. Yeah. I used to work this one. Ah. I'll send you an introduction. That'd be great. Very, very so cool. Yes, I mean, the more, we're super interested in automation and, and making things more, more efficient. So, awesome. I'll take you up on that. Cool. Well, any, uh, this was a quick one, but any, any, uh, any questions? How does 
metal injection molding compared to these two? That's a great question. I was just looking it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what I, um, and I haven't done any metal injection molding. It's a, I believe it's a similar process, and it seems like you can use more alloys, like gold, silver, platinum. Um, in fact, I was talking with a company, I think a two or three weeks ago, and it seems like you can also do super, super thin walls in terms of yep. what you can get away with on part design, whereas with conventional die casting, you're kind of stuck with your four alloys and you know roughly a millimeter thick wall. I think they were like, I don't know, um, I don't know if it was a tenth of a millimeter, but it was just insanely, insanely thin. But I'm sure the cost reflects the like you pay, you um, you're gonna pay for it. I think I think Proto Labs has announced their metal wow. injection molding for really? the magnesium. Okay, I mean you can wow. definitely die cast magnesium. Um, do you know? Does anybody know about metal injection molding? Has anybody done anything? I was given a knife by a vendor a long time. Ah. It's the only experience I had. With it. <laughs> Did it have anything? They said, hey, look, we can do this. Was there anything unique, like um, characteristic about it? It looked exactly like a injection molded part, right down to your injection pins and stuff like that. Okay. But and I, I know they can only be very small. So. Yeah, I typically yeah. It seems like it's a smaller volume. Yeah, I'll, have to, I'll do a little homework. Um, but yeah, that. Um, it's interesting to see how technology expands. Um, so I think that's sort of right on the edge, but maybe it'll get a little bit more mainstream. So especially as Apple and other companies are kind of yeah, pushing sure, the design. Yep. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. It's an awesome time to be alive. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate your spending your Wednesday night with me. So that's